I am Paul Hesslinger. I'm a film composer living and working in Hollywood. I started out with a band called Tangerine Dream and uh, lately I've been working mostly on films, TV and games. You know, I, you have to understand, I grew up in Austria and, and um, as long as I can remember I tried to get out of there. And I studied music and I played in bands and I do what every other person does who grows up and wants to make a living doing music. Uh, I uh, had some lucky coincidences, um, the most important one being that Tangerine Dream was looking for a, a keyboard player for a UK tour in 86. They had a studio in Austria and the usual friend telling a friend, telling a friend scenario uh, led to me doing an audition for them. Uh, I got the gig and that helped pull me out of Austria, brought me into an international arena. I could stay with the band, um, work with them for five years, and it really gave me a, a start in the uh, you know, international music scene. Gave me a start on more than one level, uh, not just as a player, as a producer, as a writer, and they were also doing film music, so I even got to explore film music, even though it was just from a one register uh, perspective, as I uh, explained before, and that Tangerine Dream always got asked for the same score, basically. Different movies, same score. So it was limited in that sense, and I remember after leaving Tangerine Dream, I moved to the States. Um, I was signed to private music at the time, and I was working uh, on, a, on an album project at the time. You could still spend uh, several years on one album, so you know I had plenty of time. And I was uh, uh, staying at a place that had a record label, small underground record label next door. And uh, the two girls that ran the record label sort of opened my eyes to all the other music that I had missed. Being a part of Tanger and Dream, you cannot help but seeing the world from the Tanger and Dream perspective. So in the years after I moved to LA, I basically started seeing all and hearing all this other music and discovering that there's a whole other world out there uh, to explore. Um, this is when I started to really get into world music, into other ethnic music forms, and you know, become, I would say, maybe more cosmopolitan in uh, my musicianship. And that process in a way led to film music because of the realization that I mentioned before that in film music you are less uh, pigeonholed than what I found the music scene to be where you know you had to choose a style, you had to choose a radio format, you had to choose a record label, you had to choose what you want to be and what your image is going to be and as a film composer that doesn't apply so much uh, it's really more about the project than about the personality or celebrity or whatever story you want to invent for yourself. So that appealed to me and it uh, fit into this path of exploration that I started in the early 90s sometime. Leaving aside the Tangerine Dream uh, projects, because those were like late 80s and uh, you know it was a tanger those were Tangerine Dream films. Um, I basically spent the 90s reorienting myself and exploring and started to work on smaller assignments and uh, I think 96 or 97 hooked up with uh, Graham Revell. This sort of completed my transition from somebody who works mostly on albums to somebody who works mostly on film or music for picture anyways. And spent about two, three years learning, observing, watching, learning to how to work with uh, big orchestras. I mean, uh, controlling a 90-piece orchestra is a, is a project in itself and it has to be learned, you know, you, you can't do it just uh, uh, by saying, yeah, I know classical music. Um, so by the end of the 90s I felt that um, I was going to be able to go out on my own and fortunately I uh, was hired for an HBO uh, film called Cheaters in 2000. Uh, first time directed John Stockwell and I uh, was very fortunate uh, to be hired for that project because I keep working with John, we're on our fifth movie now, and it was uh, one of those long, really good relationships uh, starting with that project. It gave me to start on my, uh, under my own name and, you know, it's led to many other projects 
So it's uh, since 2000 or so I've been venturing happily on my own. The funny answer is that, that I sometimes feel it was not a very intelligent decision because if I had decided to become a writer, I could now live with a laptop on an island uh, in the South Pacific and not worry about, uh, you know, uh, mixing consoles or, or uh, MIDI uh, uh, hang-ups or something like that. But, uh, but the true answer is, of course, I'm happy with the decision because, you know, it's, uh, it's like an adventure trip. It's, uh, it keeps changing. Uh, it keeps presenting you with different challenges. I don't feel I ever really get stuck in one uh, territory too much, and especially because I've managed to spread out over different formats, meaning games and TV and films, and I'm still doing albums and soundtrack releases. Um, it's so entertaining in the difference of, uh, of challenges that you meet that it it just is a hell of a ride. And like I said, I think if I had chosen to stay in the music world and do only albums, uh, there would be much less of a spectrum for me. And I, I am somebody who gets bored easily, so I'm just I'm glad I'm never getting bored. Your your general purpose is to support the movie. Like everybody who works on a film, you know, you want to support that story, whatever the story is that is being told, you want to enhance it. And music plays a big part in that. Uh, a lot of it is subconscious for the audience, but a lot of it is also obvious. And uh, film composers really more than anything else provide the glue, the emotional glue that really holds the movie together and helps the story to be told as effectively as possible. It's pretty interesting because uh, the way that music affects emotion starts way before the idea of the character, the direct character support, which is something actually Richard Wagner came up with and I'm therefore not uh, that happy with the concept in itself. Um, but uh, Bach already had a concept of affecting emotions. It was in German called Affektenlehre. And it basically meant a key to affect people through music in a certain way. This was in church music uh, because these were all basically parts of the Bible told and set to music and they wanted to affect people and their emotions with these stories in a certain way. So it was storytelling 101 and uh, music was used to that purpose. So he, Bach had a whole system for what he would do in which case to affect emotions in a certain way. There was a theory, there was a system for it. And you can follow uh, the story of film music really picks up there because it's the, the story of using music to affect emotions. And you can go 400 years back into history and it's already there. And everything that happened since then was a, a continuation or development from that point. And if you see that, uh, for instance, Ennio Morricone uses a lot of Bach in his, uh, uh, in his works or he borrows elements from it, you'll see the connections pretty obvious. And, you know, the, the Richard Wagner leitmotif uh, technique is something that came along much later and is sort of a simplified version of that. Because if you go to Bach, it's not as simple as that. It's not just everybody has his little theme that you recognize and can whistle, but it's much deeper in a way. It affects emotions much stronger, and this is the real theory behind film music. Leitmotif was uh, his concept that he developed that each character in the story, and he had these very convoluted storylines, of course, each of the characters would have to have its own little theme. So that, you know, in the course of a four-hour opera, uh, to avoid everybody going to sleep, um, they can recognize all these little motifs and so be guided through the story. Um, this leads straight to, uh, you know, early animation uh, scoring and even contemporary animation scoring very often employs that same technique to say, okay, this is this character, this is that character, everybody has their little theme. And it has, you know, in current Hollywood still application in that most movies, most big dramatic movies anyways, look for the main theme, the main character's theme, the bad guy theme, and so forth. So it's, it is something that is prevalent but 
it is the surface of this theory, you know, and uh, it's unfortunate that most projects just stay on the surface, whereas you could go, if you go for the emotion, you could go much deeper. The, the simple way of saying that is the theme is a melody or equated with a melody, and what I'm saying is can be many things, you know. Ultimately, it is a vibe, an atmosphere that you bring the audience into and with which means you do that should be open it shouldn't be predictable you know and melodies in that sense are a little bit predictable because it's sort of like the hook in pop music yeah it's good to have it but it's also a very simple formula and a simplistic formula and it forces you into a narrow street whereas you know film music very often has a choice of means and that's the real freedom in film music and that what makes that's what makes film music in a way more interesting to work in for me as a musician than regular music because I feel there's there's more choice of language there's more choice of styles and as long as it supports the movie people are generally happy you know you won't uh, be successful with one style and then forced to repeat that one style forever but every movie is a new project I'm talking about this a lot with colleagues and uh, this is for everybody the favorite part of the project uh, because it's sort of like kid in the candy store phase of a project you know you you get hired you get the brief this is what the story is this is what the the project is about and now you can set out to go as crazy as you want do research engulf yourself in music um, I particularly like I'm always hoping for projects that involve ethnic elements so I can explore a new ethnic kind of music that I don't know yet and uh, it's really the, the it's like a present every every time you get a, a project because you can use it to either explore other horizons or just um, you know go crazy with ideas so this is the favorite phase for everybody there's no formula for it typically you brought in in the post-production phase, which is pretty late. Um, this is when the movie's shot and edited, or at least rough edited, and the composer's brought in for a spotting session. Uh, you discuss with the sound effects and music supervisors, um, you know, and the director, what the direction should be for the music, and then you go off and, and write your score. This is the traditional model, and typically you get six to eight weeks to finish the score. Um, there are exceptions to that rule where sometimes the composer is asked to write music before the movie is shot and some of these are the most uh, remarkable examples of effective film music. Uh, Once Upon a Time in America um, is one example. Uh, Morricone wrote the score before the movie was shot. The movie was shot to the score. Uh, Tangerine Dream Film, Wages of Fear, Sorcerer was also uh, music composed before a movie was shot, movie was shot to music. Wouldn't say that works every single time, but it is remarkable that the few times that it has happened that way, or I think of uh, Amadeus would be another good example, you know, uh, it has worked remarkably well. So my suggestion to the uh, directors that I work with on a regular basis is involve me early uh, because even if I just think about music even if I think about the concept it will help the, the the process later on because I'm not doing this as a first round but I'll have time to think about and develop a concept and come from a concept that's developed rather from one and I have to develop already record already mix already deliver well if I if I could reorganize the the, the role uh, distribution I would probably call it director of music in film just like there's a director of photography I would say director of music and that would be my perfect spot because it is really a conceptual position and I so much enjoy the conceptual part of it you know this is like the beginning phase when you do research and you develop a concept uh, it's all about the ideas and having the ideas and putting the right combination of ideas together that's so fascinating and it's so motivating and uh, this is the most interesting part at the moment uh, the way the process has grown traditionally uh, you have a post supervisor or a sound supervisor who pretty much controls the way sound is applied throughout the movie including sound effects dialogue and music this is because traditionally dialogue was most important, sound effects uh, next, and music came last, sort of as a, as a gloss over. Um, 
maybe this will change in the future, maybe it will not, maybe these roles will persist, we'll see. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, more creative ways to handle this and more ways to handle this creatively, aesthetically uh, will come through. Maybe through computer games, maybe through new forms um, that will make that possible. That is one of the most asked questions for film composers. How do you work? How do you start your process? And uh, the most honest answer I can give you is that there is no formula for this. Um, every composer has at least three different ways that they're, how they're approaching it. Um, for me, particularly since I studied classical music, uh, anything from the old sitting at the piano with a pencil and paper uh, and going at it down to just hearing a sound and being in putting the sound together with a certain image and then starting an idea based on that anything goes really and there is no um, just as I said sometimes it's better to have the music before the film but I wouldn't make that a formula either I very often wrote the best music for a film before I'd actually seen the picture because I heard about the story I was inspired I sat down and I thought, man, for that character, something like this would really work well. I captured it, later played it against the picture, and it fit perfectly. And just the same, sometimes I saw a picture and said, and basically brushed everything away, saying, oh, everything that I thought about, it's not going to work here. This needs something completely different, and then wrote in response to picture something that was just more effective for a picture. So it's, like I said, there's no formula. You you have to jump in and then see what the, what the day brings. That's a very good question. And the truth is that there are two principles at play in film music. One is that film music, the more simple it is, the more chances of effect it has. And it's a lesson that I would say, you know, the first class of somebody studying film music should be that lesson. Try to be simple in your means because you're going to maximize the effect you're going to have on the audience. At the same time, I believe we are in a, in a stage now where music has evolved beyond all parameters of music, which means it opens itself up to sound, to combinations of various ethnic music forms and Western music forms, and to a merging of what was considered noise and what was traditionally considered music. So with that in mind, you really become a sound architect. And as a sound architect, if you look at the most interesting albums that you know, that you would listen to many, many times, you find the smallness of the detail very often makes the difference. And it, it will let you discover again and again new details in the music. I believe that should also be applied to film music. I think you should be able to listen to a film score over and over again and discover new things. Because it's music. And for me there's either bad music or good music. Good music always has detail and even if it's simple it will have small things that are different than other music. And I think that applies to music just as it applies to film music. Every medium has limitations, um, or forces limitations on you. Um, of course, limitations are empowerment. There would be no music without limitations. Uh, an instrument, if you want to look at it that way, is a limitation. You know, it's a limitation from an endless, infinite spectrum. And I always considered that an advantage uh, in film, that it basically limits your choices. And why I think it's particularly important, or at least for me it was important, because I grew up in Western music culture, and I grew up with a notion that I was very uncomfortable with, which was the 19th century romantic genius cult from Germany. And you even had in, in 19th century already French composers revolting, Debussy and uh, uh, Ravel were revolting against that notion. Um, but I think the key here is that you believe either that you can be a genius and sit down and write uh, a work of genius, which I don't believe that's the case, or you say you believe that you're living in a stream of ideas of 
effects that go through you and your job is to catch the right ones for the right purpose. And this is a different way of looking at music and this was one of the lessons I learned through Tangerine Dream um, that it's almost a photographic quality applied to music which basically means you have to be a little bit more humble and say well you know maybe you're not the genius maybe you're just catching the right moment at the right time and a film by the fact that from the get-go it says it's not your work it's not your baby it's not something that you came up with but it's something you work towards or something you add to makes it clear that you're not in this uh, crazy genius idea and it basically frees or I feel it frees me to really work for the purpose rather than for some uh, ego idea or ego trip that, that was born. I've, I feel a lot of musicians are affected by this. It's done a lot of damage uh, over the years to think that you really come up with this stuff. I don't think anybody has ever come up with stuff. Everybody is influenced by music that you've heard before, or by films that you've seen, by emotional experiences. And there is no such thing as, as true originality. It's just basically whether you can catch certain movements that you're going through or not and uh, you know it's those are two different theories about music and you know I, I, I want to say everybody who feels that they're a genius and want to live on that idea that's totally fine with me but for me personally it was the other way we make our own schedule so and in Hollywood I think uh, there is this uh, uh, formula that only extreme measures will lead to extreme results. Uh, a lot of directors live by those uh, standards, a lot of uh, other decision makers live by standards that say only if you make extreme pressure will you get extreme results. Um, I don't know that I subscribe, but you know we're on the receiving end. We get presented with ridiculous schedules and we just have to make it happen in those schedules. And uh, you know there are no questions asked. Um, and it also has to do a little bit with the detail aspect that I was talking before because I think you can write music and then just hand it off and say here engineer deal with this or here assistant deal with it uh, or you can stay involved in the in the process I personally like to stay involved in the process I like to stay involved up to the point where the movie has its final dub mix and my experience is that whenever you relinquish control and whenever you are not there yourself, things will go wrong. Murphy never sleeps and uh, you just have to really dedicate yourself to the process. In order to do that, you better love the process because if you don't, you're going to spend a lot of time, uh, extra time, and uh, you know, you, you're going to be exhausted at times. But for me personally, it's all worth it because I get so much uh, excitement out of the challenge itself and the exploration aspect of it that all the extreme hours don't matter. Well, there are the obvious uh, educational choices like Berkeley and uh, various other schools. Um, I personally feel it's good to have a general music education. You should be knowing what the lay of the land is, you know. Uh, if you're trying to make it completely on your own, you're gonna have problems in communication. You have to be able to communicate with musicians, you have to be able to speak the language, the various languages of musicians. So that helps. I'm not sure that film music specific schools help that much because in my impression they usually teach uh, a small range of the spectrum. They, they cannot teach everything that's going on. Um, the, for me the most educational time was after Tangerine Dream, after I'd already done several film scores but always in one style because it was always Tangerine Dream. I've started working as a programmer with Graham Revell and I basically learned for two, three years all the different projects that he was involved in that either involved orchestra or not orchestra or had various requests but it really opened me up to the spectrum and it allowed me to watch the process unfold both the production of music the writing of music the creative side but also the political side and this is something 
you have to experience before you're able yourself to jump in and fill that role. Nothing will replace the direct experience of that. Being in the process, being in a team, working with a team on projects is the only real school there is. And you can take preparation steps, like learning general music theory, which I, I think is a good idea, but in the end you'll have to find somebody who you can work with for a few years and just learn the lay of the land. The, the requirements in the technical sense are becoming better and better. Um, I'm almost jealous of people starting out now because they need so much less than we used to when we started out. Uh, when I started out, keywords were really expensive. Today you can get you know, a G5 or even a high-power laptop, get some cool software and you're off and running. Um, what I keep around half of my equipment at this point is for nostalgic values you know I just like the sounds I like the units I've become friends with them and I keep them around uh, I wouldn't really need half of it basically it comes down to computers you know you need an array of maybe seven eight machines and that's your setup this is this is the new way uh, studios and, and production sites are set up and it's no different for musicians than it is for uh, CGI people or anybody else uh, think of it as uh, sheet music plus you know you're just as you write on sheet music you're writing into the computer with the advantage that you're actually hearing part or most of what you're writing um, so, you know, it's a very glorified version of sheet music, obviously. Uh, and it also ties into the studio. You know, the old way was you went into a room, you took a guitar, you played it, you recorded it, and you took the recording and you sampled the recording, and then you did something with the sample or something with the recording, mixed it. Now this is all fused, and there are virtual instruments, and uh, you can basically, the, the whole process of recording, sampling, and writing has become one platform, it's happening on one platform. And I'm pretty much using all of these techniques interactively. There's no difference for me between writing and mixing and producing. I produce and mix half of the track as I'm writing it, and half of it I'll finish later on in final mix. Basically, studio client, uh, stu uh, clients today have uh, gotten used to uh, a level of demonstration that goes very close to final product. Meaning uh, every director, every studio executive, every producer today expects to hear the score before you record it. Uh, which means that your ability to do mock-ups has to be pretty serious. Uh, Hans Zimmer started that about 10 years ago and it's become pretty much standard right now. The reason for this is also pretty obvious is that orchestral sessions are very expensive so for them to really spend that kind of money they would like to know before that they actually like the score otherwise you know they'll they'll be wasting a lot of cash. So it is understandable but it it does complicate our process quite significantly because first we need to mock up the orchestral parts and then we got to retranslate that back into actual musician's language so that an actual orchestra can play it. So it has made our, our process quite a little bit more complex. On the upside, we also gain some control in this process in that we can manage the production of a score today in ways that were simply impossible uh, 10 years ago. And added computer power, added production power, um, really breaks open um, the choice of elements, the choice of styles that you combine, how you can process those or alter those. Um, so the, the studio has really, really moved inside the digital sphere and it's giving us options that we simply didn't have before. Oh, it was very basic. Uh, you basically, uh, you know, uh, John Williams was famous for uh, writing, and I, th I believe he may still do that, uh, write scores with a stopwatch and a piano. And he would play his themes on a piano for the director and say, okay, this is the main theme. Um, it's going to sound great when orchestra plays it. You know, and that's the old way. And, you know, if you're John Williams, you can still afford that. But if you're a young composer starting out, 
you better have a, a good way to emulate orchestra because that's what people are going to expect. They want to hear a final product. The main problem is that every sample sounds good for a certain purpose. It will, it will not be a musician. A musician, you, if it's a good musician, you give him anything to play and he'll play it. A sample, because it's a snapshot, and the nature of snapshots is it's just that one moment, it will only sound good for a couple of purposes, but it can't play everything. So, you have a choice here. Either you compose something that's going to sound bad, and you'll have to say to the director, well, it's going to sound great when a musician plays it, or you're going to play what the sample sounds good in, which limits you to only a very small range of choices. So this is the crux that exists, and uh, you know I've I've heard both. I've heard people do write great music, but it sounded horrible because the samples were not made for it. And I've heard you know very limited music, but it sounded great, and it was the samples used the right way. Uh, I can tell you that in the end, what I what I feel, what stands behind it though, is that. Again, it comes down to good music and bad music and the fact that good music will find its way. It will find its way through limitations of samples as it finds its way through limitations of instruments. How many great songs were written on a six-string guitar and how limited is that as an instrument compared to a piano? And so, again, every limitation leads to certain music forms. The fact that a lot of sample-based musicians write bad music doesn't mean there's something wrong with the samples. It basically just means they didn't have a good day or they didn't have a great idea. Um, in the end, anything you work with can be used to make great music. It's really more about catching the moment, I think. It's tough because it's sort of asking a musician what were what are your favorite pieces of music and there's so the truth is there's so many. You know, it's it's uh, it seems tough and unfair at the same time to single out a few. But I'd be happy to talk about composers or film composers that I that I think just had a significant impact. Um, I'm not the first one to to be a big fan of Bernard Herrmann. I think really the what I mentioned before to take a step back as a composer and acknowledge that you know maybe you're not the genius, maybe you're here to fulfill a function. Um, that function has to do with simplicity and maximizing effect. This is really the, uh, something that Bernard Herrmann was the first one to apply into film music. It's the reason why his scores are so effective, is that he took a step back and he really served the movie first. Um, next on that list I would put um, Ennio Morricone, simply because uh, I think in terms of emotional support for movies, I don't know any other composer who has been able to get under my skin the same way with some of the scores. Uh, and it's funny too because I know he's doing film scores quasi on the side. He's not uh, seeing that as his main focus and maybe that's one of the reasons why it's so successful and why it's so effective. Um, so those would be my, my two uh, legends to, to uphold. and. Uh, from current composers, I, I do like uh, Antonio Pinto very much, um, who's come out of nowhere really, and uh, did some scoring in Collateral that I thought was very effective. Uh, did Lord of War, um, he also did Central Station, and uh, a movie I extremely like uh, called Chronicus. So uh, I like him a lot, and I like Alexander Desplat, who did um, The Girl with the Pearl Earring and uh, then Birth. So those are my eclectic choices for film composers I admire. I don't personally conduct. Um, I don't have training in conducting. And I also believe that uh, as a producer and as a music director, uh, to really control the process, you have to be where the control of the process is and these days that's not uh, the conductor stand but it's the studio. It's where you do the recording, it's where the director is. Uh, there are many many stories where the composer is out conducting and meanwhile there are all kinds of political ongoings in the recording booth. 
um, where the decision makers basically are. So you want to be where the process is controlled and that is the studio and behind the console. Um, I also, this is what a, a good engineer friend of mine told me, believe that conducting is a special talent. Meaning that if you write the music and you think you know exactly how that music should sound, that doesn't mean you're a good conductor. A good conductor is a performer. He has a certain performance talent. It's almost like a dancer uh, or an actor in that you can present a front to the orchestra that motivates everybody. This is different than knowing what the music really is about. Um, if the two come, sometimes the two come together in one person. Jerry Goldsmith is a good example for that, you know. And then it's great because you get both, even though nowadays still. What I said applies is that politically it's more important to be in the recording booth than it is out there with the orchestra. The or orchestra is going to like you. No matter if you don't write really bad music, the orchestra is going to like you. But, uh, but the decisions about you know, how your score is being handled are made with the director and with the studio executives and whoever else is in the recording room. Very often, um, Time code is notated on, on sheet music, but um, it is really the job of the film composer to bring these two spheres together. In other words, to pick his points that he wants to hit and to establish a score. The score will be synced to time code, and if score runs in a certain tempo, then it will hit these points as planned. So it's really a mathematical exercise, which with the use of computers, of course, has gotten much easier because I can mock up tempo maps today that are very complex and very complicated. They'll be spit out by a click box, everybody gets them in the headphones and it's no problem. And most action scores these days, because they have to be frame accurate, the audience is used to it and expects it, are really, really uh, difficult, have difficult and complex click maps. And only the, the better musicians, specifically LA and London, are really able to play these complicated click tracks. If you're going anywhere other than these two cities, you're going to have a problem. Who's responsible for hiring the musicians? Uh, contractors. Um, there are, you know, uh, standard contractors in, in each of the bigger uh, cities, and uh, it's like a family, you know. This is uh, just like I, I keep all the equipment around. It's, you know, there's, there's a family feel to working with musicians several times because you get to know each other, you help each other out. Uh, they of course like when they're being hired, but I like when I get a good orchestra. And the complexity of putting together a good 90-piece orchestra should not be underestimated. It's tough enough to put like a 10-piece band together, you know, and make sure, because if there's one bad apple, you're gonna pay for it, you know. If the bass player is not tight, you're gonna have a problem. Same with the 90 piece orchestra, you know, if uh, anybody in the brass section is not tight, you're going to hear it and you're going to hear it on a 90 piece take. So it's very important and the contractor um, that I work with usually includes the concert master and some of the section leaders in the choice of the musicians, which I think is a good, very good practice. I think it's a scene like every other scene, you know, um, if you start fresh out to break into the film music scene, you're gonna find it hard, because it's a scene, and you know, um, there's a lot of people competing for it. Same for television, same for games, it's not different. Games are a younger scene, and the executives are younger, the decision makers are younger, and uh, the people you'll be working with generally just are younger. Uh, that helps a lot of aspects, especially when it comes to newer st electronica, um, anything that uh, comes from an MTV culture, for lack of a better term. And I enjoyed it. It's also enjoyable because uh, it's based on nonlinear storytelling. So compared to that, film is pretty limiting in that it's just one story told in one way. Game can be told in several ways. Uh, if you know how to use loops, how to use sampling, it's a definite, definite advantage in, in game scores. So for me, it's really a perfect setup, and I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, you know, in, in film, you get a script, 
uh, to read through before you start the process. In, in games, you get an Excel spreadsheet with uh, several layers and uh, you know uh, an enormous amount of data to, to look through. So it, it's just different scenes, and it's uh, for me the 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 biggest fun aspect in this is to jump from one to the other, you know, and to go into a crazy game and then go back and do an, uh, a, a traditional film. That's the real fun of it. The mix, first of all, in film music is a multi-stage process. There is not one mix. Uh, second, as I explained before, I start mixing when I'm writing. So it is not like we record guitar guitar is on the tape, comes to the mixing board, and then we mix it. It's, it's really much more uh, interactive right now. Um, I do a music mix mostly because I want to get a sec second perspective of an engineer that I trust, and uh, it's another collaborative step uh, that I'm taking and saying, okay, I'm delivering this music in this shape and form. And what happens in film is there's another mix, the so-called dub mix, happening after that when actually all audio components, meaning dialogue, sound effects, and music will get mixed together for a final film mix. So this is a mix after the mix, and part of uh, my challenge in the music mix is to predict what's going to happen in the final mix so that the music will happily coexist with dialogue and with, uh, with sound effects. Sound effects being by far the more difficult challenge because sound effects now bleed into music and music ble bleeds into sound effects. So this is our part of our job. In, in an ideal world, you would get together and plan this as one creative project because that's what sound for picture is. Um, in the end, you're going to hear everything at the same time, and if there's a good concept and if there's a good uh, complementary effect between the elements, it's going to benefit the, mu the movie more, and if there's not good coherence, then it's going to be less effective for all elements involved. Um, unfortunately, egos, of course, play into that scene, and I've started many projects with everybody clapping themselves on the shoulder saying we're going to work together on this and sound effects and music are going to talk. But months later when you hit the dub stage for the final mix, it's a different picture and you know there are egos and people will pull little tricks just so that the sound effects are a little louder or that the music is a little louder. I guess it's just part of human nature, you know, to be competitive at times. I wish it to be collaborative all the times, but the truth is Sometimes it's collaborative and sometimes it's competitive. You have to be prepared for both. My only advice would be to, to be aware that there's two principles that will make you succeed as a film composers, composer. One is uh, persistence and the other one is luck. Um, luck will choose its own moment in time. You can't count on it, you can hope for it. but it'll happen when it decides to happen. Persistence is the only thing that is under your control, that you can apply in whichever measure uh, you, see, you see justified. And uh, this is really all there is to it. Talent, I think, is you have to kind of take for granted. You have to trust in yourself and say, I believe that I have enough talent to do this. And if you can say that, then it really comes down to uh, persistence or stubbornness or however you call it and just stay with it, stay at it, keep working at it. Um, I have not done a single job yet where I wasn't dissatisfied with something that I was doing so I had to learn something new or I had to explore something new and this is part of that process. Uh, understand the process is never finished. If it were life would be boring and the job would be boring. So if you're aware of all of these facts, then you can just keep working, and in keep working, you'll get better and better.